someone, someone who has passed away, or someone who has a need in your life. <coughs> Candles are a special way to uh, allow us to pray. They have a, a lot of power. They remind us of the light of Christ. And so, when I first got here to St. Joseph, husband of Mary, Father Mark asked me, he says, uh, now, in your last church, what was one thing that was very successful in raising funds for the parish? Because we are going to be having this big construction project here at St. Joseph, Husband of Mary. That's what we're starting here. And he says, well, what was something that was very successful? And I said, memorial candles. And so... He went ahead and, at my urging, got all of these memorial candles. Because I said, all of you, uh, because there was no problem in my last parish, a small parish, to, for people to buy all of these memorial candles for their loved ones who had passed away. And so he went ahead and bought all of these memorial candles. And now we have all of these memorial candles. <laughs> and people are not getting the memorial candles. <laughs> And so we have an overabundance of memorial candles. And that's why I come before all of you, okay, this evening. Because uh, I need you to please consider, okay, <laughs> getting a memorial candle <laughs> for someone who has passed away, particularly from your families and friends. Uh, and these candles are absolutely wonderful. They really are. I got these when I was pastor in Crescent City. I was there for three years in my last parish. And the people really liked having these memorial candles because it was something in the church that they could have with their loved one's name on it. And these candles burn 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're real beeswax candles. And they're a wonderful... Uh, reminder of for your family member or friend or someone who has passed away. And so uh, I would really ask you to please consider getting a memorial candle. Uh, they are $500 for one year or $2,000 for five years. I know that that's a lot of money and some of you can't do it. And if you can't do it, that's okay. But if you just have money in the bank, it's probably sitting there not doing anything. Help us out. <laughs> okay? It'd be, uh, because we are having this massive construction project here, and all of these funds that will be raised from this will go towards that. So, uh, you know, towards helping out here. Now, the other thing is... Uh, if I can get a memorial candle, and I'm getting a memorial candle for my grandfather who, who passed away, and if I on my salary can afford $2,000, okay, to get a memorial candle, why 2000 Because I'm saving 500 okay? And so... <laughs> If I can afford it, I know many of you can as well. So please, uh, please consider getting a memorial candle. Just come to the parish office, okay? Uh, and if you want, multi the, I printed a hundred extra forms here. So if you, if you need. <laughs> And guess who else is getting a memorial candle? Father Mark. Father Mark. Mm -hmm. So. How many years? So. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You. Have to, I, anyway. Um, so okay, that's that. I know you will be very, very generous. I'm confident. And these are great, it's a great thing anyway, I mean. So let's start our class today, okay? 
I just know that all of you will help out. You know, I know that there's money out there. I know it. Okay? There's just one problem. It's in your pockets. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your wonderful gift this evening of gathering us here today. And we thank you for the gift of your word. Inspire us as we share here this evening. Fill our hearts with your peace as we glorify you by saying glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. So you know there is absolutely nothing in the Bible that causes me more pain or consternation or something that messes with me more than what happened on the cross. Jesus utters a few phrases while on the cross. One of the things he says is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then he says, I thirst. Those things mess with me too. But nothing messes with me as much as when Jesus cries, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? Nothing messes with me more. And I would venture to say that all of us have heard this cry of Jesus from the cross. And when you hear it, doesn't it mess with you as well? I'm sure it does. Here, in this cry of dereliction, neglect. Jesus is feeling abandoned by the very one who sent him. Each one of us too, like Jesus, has been sent from our Father in heaven here down to earth because God made us and we come from God. We know that from Holy Scripture that even before we were made in our mother's wombs, God knew us and God dedicated us. We come from God and we have been sent here on the assignment. This assignment that we call life. This pilgrimage that we call life. This journey that we call life. And the experience of neglect on this journey, this assignment that we call life is something we all have to face. Each one of us, just like our Lord did. Now, Jesus calls his father here Eloi. This is the Hebrew derivative of the word for God in the Hebrew scriptures. You might have heard of the word for God, Yahweh. You've heard that one. Uh, you've heard Jehovah. It's made popular by the Jehovah Witnesses. It's one of the names for God, right? Then there is, uh, but another one that you probably have heard is Elohim. It's a word used for God in the Hebrew Scriptures or the Old Testament. And this Eloi that Jesus uses here is a derivative of the word Elohim. And the Hebrew people would only use the word for God Elohim or Eloi when they would be referring to God as deliverer or rescuer or savior. So it's referring to the delivering or saving aspect of God. In other words, Jesus calls God deliverer in the same breath as he calls him the great abandoner, the one who leaves him, who abandons him. It's a human moment that our Lord is experiencing here. What he's saying in essence is that God is contradicting himself because you are supposed to be my deliverer, my rescuer, but your actions are contradicting who you are. You've abandoned me. Don't you feel like that so many times in your own life? 
You know, I believe in a saving God, the God who didn't just save me once when he delivered me from death, but the God who continually saves me. We call him our Savior, do we not? We refer to Jesus as our Savior. So you are my Savior, but at the same time, I feel you as my abandoner. Isn't that the human experience? Think about it in your own life. You're supposed to be my saving God, and yet my bills are not paid. Why? You're supposed to be a delivering God, Elohim, and yet I still have this sickness, cancer or diabetes or whatever it is, that's still running through my body, and yet you're my saving God. Why? How could that be? You are Elohim, and yet my marriage is still in shambles. Why? You are my savior, and yet you didn't save my 13-month-old from dying this past uh, Saturday, I had the, a service for a 13-month-old. His parents are left with that while they're celebrating a saving God. At the same time, it's the God who they feel abandoned them. You are a deliverer, and yet you didn't deliver my 16-year-old from committing suicide or trying to commit suicide. Why? You are my rescuer, and yet you didn't rescue me from the hands of my enemies. You, didn't, you are my rescuer, my savior, and you didn't save me from falling into addiction or giving in to the people who dragged me into it. I call you Shalom. You know, it's another word for God, peace. You've all heard that word, Shalom, peace. And yet, I still can't get a good night's sleep. I'm still depressed, full of anxiety. You're supposed to rescue me, and yet I still have to take medicine every single day. What Jesus is saying here from the cross is that God's actions are contradicting God's nature. The rescuing God seems absent, not there. Now, there's one thing, one other thing, one aspect of this whole thing. You know, Jesus here is not just mad with God. And it's okay to be mad with God, to be angry with God. There's nothing wrong with that. Jesus got angry, did he not? And Jesus was sinless. He was fully human and fully divine. And so, to have feelings of abandonment, of anger, being mad, there's nothing wrong with that. You gotta be real with God. Tell him how you feel. He's a, but he's not just upset here with God. He's also upset with himself. He's upset with himself. He's angry with himself. Because this is not an assignment, the assignment that he's undertaken here, that he was demanded to do. It's an assignment that Jesus decided to do. How many of us have those same things happen to us? We get mad at ourselves, not just at God. When we realize that, for example, the assignment of my marriage that you chose to get into, you chose the partner you're with, this was not what you expected. I'm thinking here of a couple that I married, and it's not too long, uh, and when, when, they were, when I was preparing them for marriage, I told them, you know, this is for better or worse, in sickness and in health, no matter what happens. And they were very dedicated. They, also, they seemed to be, you know, they were all gung-ho, I'm, I'm taking on this assignment here. It's great. And not too long after they were married, the young man went in to have a medical procedure and you know w with medical procedures today uh, you m many medical procedures you get anesthesia do you not you know even a colonoscopy okay I've heard okay <laughs> I'm 31, so. 
but even a colonoscopy you get anesthesia and so while you're under under you can be deprived of oxygen and this is what happened and so he ended up brain damaged and there was a medical settlement and uh, the insurance company settled and the wife after a while took half of the settlement and said goodbye I didn't sign up for this I didn't sign up for this well I was there she did sign up for it she did sign up for it how many people get upset at their job when they realize it was not what they said yes to after a while and they give up and they go to another job and then they keep going to a different job and a different job and a different job I mean, you keep going your whole life how many you know uh, how many priests get all worked up and angry when they realize it was they who said yes to the assignment and the assignment wasn't what they expected it to be I was ordained well, the seven finished the seminary with me, okay? Only five are priests today. It was not what they signed up for, okay? Now, th for different reasons, you know, we, people, people leave, but, you know, it's the same thing as, as in marriage or in, or in, other circumstances in life how many parents get angry with themselves when they realize it was they who said yes to children you know one of the things is uh, when you walk into a situation where a 13 month old has died you ask yourself in fact, uh, I took our seminarian that's here with us on, on Saturday with me to that, to that funeral. Uh, I wonder if a lot of times, you know, is you, you think to yourself, is this what I signed up for? And life is hard, in other words. It's one big arduous assignment. when we see what we said yes to so often we say as Jesus did this is too much this is too much he said the same thing this is too much and I'm so glad you know that Jesus had this moment on the cross because it gives me hope that my anointing does not dismantle my humanity all of us, you've attended baptisms, right? You've all attended baptism. What happens at baptism? You get anointed with the holy chrism. And it's an anointing that leaves an indelible mark on your soul. Something that can never, ever be taken away from you. And just because you are anointed, and at baptism we don't just receive one anointing, but two anointings and just because you are anointed at your confirmation or a priest is anointed with the sacred chrism as well just because you are anointed does not mean you're not human that doesn't take away the fullness of the human experience Jesus' anointing him being fully God did not take away the full experience of his humanity did it? No, it didn't. And you know, this makes me feel, this moment that Jesus had, makes me feel so good. Because whenever I have my human moments, and all of you have your own human moments, you know, like, uh, whether it's going through people who have terrible life experiences, or accompanying people who have faced a loss, in their life or whatever it is it gives me great consolation because when I throw a tantrum at God that means I'm in good company because I'm in the company of Jesus it's okay to complain to God and to vent to him and to feel abandoned you're a human being don't be so hard on yourself 
If Jesus felt this way, what makes any of us think that we will ex escape this human reality of our assignment? We can't escape it. There's no defense before the cross. No defense whatsoever. So, I don't care how anointed you are, how much you pray, how many rosaries you say, how many masses you attend. You know, you might go to St. Elizabeth's at 6.30, come to St. Joseph, husband of Mary at 8, go to the cathedral at noon, okay? Uh, I don't know where there are evening masses here, okay? It, none of that will take away the experience of your humanity. Or how much, I, how much time you spend with the Bible. Life can and, and will bring a twist that will face you with a human moment. This coming September, we are getting ready to canonize Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who faced this human reality for 99% of her life, her earthly assignment. And if she faced this struggle, what makes you think you won't? So have you ever been there when you feel like you have done everything you are supposed to do on the assignment and your obedience has produced so much pain and agony and suffering and you end up feeling abandoned, alone, with no one, not even the one who sent you on the assignment there with you? Suffering will put you in touch with your humanity, will it not? Everything is going just absolutely wonderful. You're keeping all the rules and regulations and, you know, you're, you're doing all the prayers. You, 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 you're doing absolutely everything and yet things go wrong and we throw a tantrum. We're in good company. It's dark. The Bible tells us that at, a, at that very moment, darkness came and covered the earth. Now, what time did Jesus die? Three o'clock. At three o'clock, it's not dark outside. Jesus is feeling abandoned. He's in the darkness. And yet, he has to fulfill his assignment for God. <clears throat> Sometimes you have to work for God in the darkness. Push forward while walking in the darkness. I may not feel, you think I feel like, you know, doing the, the things that I've just described for you all the time? You think I feel like keeping the assignment all the time? No, I'm a human being. Like any of you, you may not feel like it all the time, but you got to keep push forward in the assignment that you've been given and not give up while in the darkness. Push forward. There are times you pray and God is not talking to you. You don't hear Him. You keep praying anyway. Jesus doesn't give up because He feels abandoned and because He's in the darkness. He keeps pushing forward. And this is what you and I need to do as well when we are in the darkness. We have to keep going, not give up. Was Christ's dark period a positive experience for him or a negative experience? You have to ask yourself that question. Was what happened on the cross, the darkness covers the earth, and Jesus feels neglected, was it a positive or a negative experience? Of course, it was a positive experience. Nothing that happens to you in this life is by accident. Nothing. God allows all the things that happen to us in our life for a purpose and for a reason. We may not know what that is. That's where faith comes in, and faith requires trust. You may not know why, but you trust in the Lord. Think of yourself, think, when is it that you've grown the most as a person of faith? It was in the dark periods of your life. When you went through the, through the cross, through the feelings of abandonment, that you got closer to the Lord. 
Not when things were going wonderfully in your life. You may not know it at the time, but your experiences in the darkness are positive experiences. Otherwise, your loving Father would not permit them to take place. Do we, not, we, we don't just call God our Father. We call God our loving Father. If you truly believe in a loving Father, what loving Father would permit you to go through something that was not good for you? Ask yourself that. Otherwise, stop calling God your loving Father. If we, okay, is God all-powerful? Yes, and if God is all-powerful, then He can put an end to any darkness, any suffering, any problem we are experiencing. But He doesn't, does He? God knows what's best for us. And all those things that have happened to us are for our good. That's what the Bible teaches us over and over again. So if you believe in a loving God, then what loving father would allow their children to go through something that isn't good for them? In other words, the hell you went through before or are going through is permitted by your father to make you better. Just as the hell Jesus went through was permitted by his Father to allow him to bring salvation to the world. Your hell is for your salvation and the salvation of those around you. Now when I say hell, the definition of hell is the absence of God. The definition of heaven is the presence of God. So the, when we talk about hell, we're talking about the absence of God. On the cross, Jesus has an experience of hell. He experiences hell, the absence of God. When we experience hell in our life, and you have experienced hell in your life before, maybe you're not experiencing it right now, but let me guarantee you something about this earthly assignment that we are on. You will experience it. It can't escape us. Before the cross, there is no defense. We can't, any of us. Your hell is for your salvation and the salvation of those around you. And salvation comes from the word, the word salvation comes from the word health, for your health and the health of those around you. I was just in the Ukraine, okay, and there I heard something a lot. And anywhere I went, every single day, you know what was the word I heard the most? Nazdrovie. Do you know what Nazdrovie means? To your health. Wherever I went, they were all holding up bottles of vodka. Okay? <laughs> and we go, Nazdrovie. Okay? Now, I'm not su uh, suggesting that, you know, I'm not promoting vodka here, okay? But what I'm... What I am promoting is this idea that anything and everything is to our health. Anything, any hell we've gone through or are going through. Nazdrovie. Repeat that. Nazdrovie. Oh, how wonderful. Okay. <laughs> now. Where did the hell happen in Jesus' life? It happened in the darkness. And in Isaiah 45, the prophet Isaiah tells us that God says, I will give you hidden treasures in the darkness. You have to stop being so addicted to light and start looking for God in the darkness as well. In the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, everything is made by God from the darkness. God creates in the darkness. Darkness is not bad. You've got to get away from that. We're so afraid of darkness. It, it's not bad. It's good for us. It's hard to hear, but it's the truth. God creates in the darkness. In the book of Exodus, God promises to come to Moses on Mount Sinai in a dense of dark clouds. Darkness is divine and God dwells in darkness. Abraham meets God in the darkness. Jacob wrestles with the angel at night in the midst of darkness. 
Oh, and here's one thing that you all know. The angels announce Christ's birth in the middle of the night. That means it was dark. <laughs> Darkness is everything I do not know, I cannot control, and I'm afraid of. But that's just a beginner's definition. Because if I am a believer in God, then darkness is also where God dwells. God was there with Jesus in the darkness. As much as we may feel that God has abandoned us, God never abandons us. God may also be frightening and uncontrollable and largely unknown to me, yet I decide to trust God anyway in the darkness. As much as Jesus didn't feel God during the moment of his darkness, God was there with him and God is with you in the midst of your darkness. This is the great consolation of our faith. That God is with us. It's all we need. You don't need anything else. You think you need more. But if you've got God, what else do you need? You've got the biggest miracle you could ever want or desire. That God is with me. And if God is with me, it's all going to be fine. So, at the heart of the Christian message that we learn and that we are talking about here today is that when the bottom drops out and you're screaming your guts out at God, you're saying, where are you? Where are you, God? Where? At the heart of the Christian message is, there's more. There's more. That's at the heart of the Christian message. There's more. And if you are willing to enter the cloud of unknowing and meet God in the dark, maybe even the darkness of a tomb, ooh, now here's something. You might be in for a surprise as Jesus was. And the great hope in the Christian message is not that you will be rescued from the dark, as Jesus wasn't. But if you are able to trust God all the way into the dark, you may be surprised. Because at the end, God, your rescuer, your deliverer, your savior, always delivers. As he delivered Jesus, he comes to deliver us. Always. And you know, one thing here is, God is silent here, is he not? Jesus screams out at God, and God is seemingly silent. And God's silence, and you feeling his absence, is never an excuse to abort your assignment in this life, to give up. It's never an excuse. Just because you feel like God isn't there, doesn't give you the right to give up. Having marital problems is no excuse for giving up on your marriage. You got to keep fighting. You may not feel like going to work, but this is your assignment. You got to keep going. You may not feel like praying or going to mass or going to confession, but it's your assignment. You may not feel like being a mom all the time, or a wife all the time, or a husband all the time, but this is your assignment. You may not feel like eating right and checking your sugar and exercising, but this is called life. You may not feel like attending those AA meetings, but it's your assignment. I'm not just called to keep the assignment when I feel like it. It's not about, you know, doing things when I feel like doing them. I may be in a situation where I'm not feeling God, but I will keep the assignment. You think I feel like preparing a Bible study every week? <laughs> I say, great, let's study all those books, you know, and all the stuff that I've had, you know, and you, you know, or a homily every week, or visiting people who are dying daily. I visited three people on the verge of death today. All very powerful experiences, very different experiences. Or accompanying people who have terminal illness, or comforting parents who have lost their baby, 
or dealing with a couple who can't get pregnant or consoling a widow of 56 years who doesn't know how to keep going. You think I always feel like doing the assignment? Welcome to life. <laughs> God may not be always saying something to you, but you go ahead and say something to Him. You know, we may not always feel God. Whenever somebody comes and says, Father, you know, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. You know what I say? Well, it's not as important because as much as you don't believe in God, God always believes in you. God always believes in you and in us. The praise that scares the devil is the praise that you give the Lord in the darkness because he thinks that he is... We call him the prince of darkness, do we not? He thinks he's the prince of, the, of darkness because the more hell he can throw on you, the more chances he has of taking you away from the walk, the journey. But God is God over everything, both light and darkness. You see, the devil thinks the more problems he can throw on you, he will make you give up on the assignment. But you won't. You will not. So, Jesus, when he finds himself in the middle of the darkness, he doesn't just speak some emotion. What does he do? He goes for something his mother taught him. The Bible. The Bible was given to us by our mother, the church didn't just fall from heaven, okay? And it's so important to know our scripture. In the darkness, we go for the Bible. The Bible is the best gift that you can give your children. The gift of faith. And notice when Jesus calls out to God, he doesn't just say, God, why have you forsaken me? Does he say that? Does he say, God, why have you forsaken me? No. He says, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God. He doesn't say God. He says, my God. You might have missed it. But he says, my God. And sometimes you just have to remind yourself that no matter what happens in this life, no matter the hell you are catching, he is still your God. I can't find a job, but he's still my God. We have a personal God. I have marital problems, but he's still my God. I may have addictions, but he's still my God. I may have cancer or diabetes or depression or anxiety running through my body, but he's still my God. No matter the hell or the darkness, he is still and always will be my God. And you know, God answers all of our prayers. If there's one thing that's clear from the Bible, Jesus says, ask for whatever you want in my name and my Father will give it to you. God answers each and every one of our prayers. It's very clear. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers by what God says, by, but by what God does. Does God not answer Jesus' prayer? Of course He does. As He answers your prayer, every time you pray, your prayer is answered. You just don't realize it because we're so limited in our understanding of the ways of God. The Bible says God's ways are not our ways. So how can you know, we, we try to pretend that we can understand and get it. We can't. God answers Jesus' prayer by giving him endurance. Endurance. He endures. The fact that you are still here, in spite of and despite of all the hell that you have caught in your life before, and you went through a lot, each and every one of you. I know some of your stories. I don't know all of your stories because I haven't been here that long. But the, just by looking out here, 
and the stories that I know. You've gone through so much in your life. And not every single one of you here this evening. And the fact that you are still here means that God hears you and answers your prayer. You're here this evening. That says a lot. God answered your prayers. Did He not? You're here. In spite of all the stuff that has happened to you. And all this, maybe you're catching hell right now. And you're in darkness. And God is answering your prayers because He has you here. He's giving you endurance. He has brought you through before and He will bring you through whatever it is that you're going through right now. You should have been dead because of all the things you went through. Think about it. But you're not. You're here. In spite of the rape, the abuse, the bullying, all that you went through, the spitting, you are here. You've gone through so much and while all that you went through should have had you dead, God answered your prayers. And you're here to praise Him, to thank Him and to glorify Him. And that really irks the devil. So this is the middle of the day and darkness comes. No matter how great our life may be going, darkness has it to it that it comes at the wrong time, does it not? It's the middle of the day, didn't you notice? And darkness comes. It's like that in our own life. Things may be going absolutely wonderful. You're married, you know, you have a wonderful life and all of a sudden you find out your husband's cheating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you find out your wife has cancer. Or you find out your house has been robbed. Or you find out you're going to get laid off after working all those years. All sorts of things. Or you find out your kids are getting a divorce. But you know, while it may be the wrong time for you, it's the right time for God. The right time in providence. While it may be the wrong time for you, it's the right time for God. Darkness in biblical theology is a symbol for God's judgment. And God was judging the world at this time. And Jesus dies in the darkness and pays for our sins. God was judging the Roman system at that time. That crucified the Lord and all of our sins that put him there. And Jesus dies in the darkness and pays for our sins our transgressions, our faults. He paid for anything and everything that you might have done and that I have done. We are all forgiven. This is the hardest thing for people to get in their life, that God forgives you for anything and everything that you may have done. Jesus paid for it all there on the cross. He's our Savior. Jesus had to be abandoned and neglected, forsaken, so that I could be forgiven. And that's why I rejoice today in the, in the midst of all of this. Now, I always like to save the best for last. You know, uh, Jesus quotes Psalm 22 here, the 22nd Psalm. So he only gives us the first verse of Psalm 22. But what's on his mind is the entire psalm. The entire psalm is on his mind. And if you read the entire Psalm 22, which I know all of you will do when you go home tonight because I, I just know it, okay? Uh, you will see that the Psalm, it's a very long Psalm, it has more than 30 verses in it. And this Psalm starts off one way 
but ends in another way. And that's what Jesus is, that's what, on, that's what on his mind, that's what's on his mind. It starts off with victimization, but ends with vindication. Jesus starts feeling like a victim. He starts off. But he knows that the psalm ends in another way. The psalm ends with God delivering his people. Coming and saving them as he came to save his own son, Jesus Christ. And this is what Jesus is thinking about. Now, I have something to share with all of you. You know, the classes that I enjoyed the most in college were not theology classes. <laughs> or philosophy classes. The classes that I enjoyed the most were theater classes. Does that surprise you? <laughs> okay. So, I know this probably surprises most of you here. Okay. And I was part of a play in college, and some of my friends were doing a report on plays and decided to come to the play that I was in at my invitation. And so after the play, I called them and I said to them, how did you enjoy the show? Did you like the play? And they said, you know, we couldn't do the report because they stopped in the middle. It ended abruptly when the curtains came down and the stage was darkened. They thought it was all over. So I had to explain to them that in order for the shifting of the stage to take place, the curtains have to come down and darkness has to cover the stage. In order for the, for the, for the set to be shifted. In order for the stage to be shifted, the curtains come down, you've been to plays, right? And you know what happens, there's darkness that covers the whole thing. Even they even lowered the, the lights in the whole building for a while, and then they put them up so you can go to the bathroom. But, you know... <laughs> uh, uh, you, you all know what happens. So I had to explain to them. I said, this has to happen so that the folks in charge, the people who are in charge, can shift the stage. And so, I came to make an announcement to all of you this evening. Okay? The darkness you are in is not the end of your story. The person in charge is shifting your stage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's shifting your stage. In other words, it's shifting season. God is shifting your life. God is shifting your life. There are better days ahead, in other words. God is shifting your finances, your family life, your personal life, your health, your prayer life, your marriage, your job, your sorrow. Think about this. Jesus' story wasn't over in the darkness. And yours isn't either. Your story isn't over. It doesn't end. My story isn't over, as the Psalms proclaim. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And that's what we await. That is our hope. It's shifting season. Weeping may endure for the night. The darkness only lasts but a short while. Joy comes in the morning. That's hope. And that's what we live with as we pray this evening in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this beautiful time together where we know that we are in the shifting season because this is the Easter season. And Easter season is shifting season. When you come into our life to shift things around with your love and your power. And we know that you hear our prayers. And so we bring these prayers before you. Prayers for ourselves, for our family, for our children especially, that you protect them, keep them safe, keep them in your care. And even if they do not believe in you, we know that you believe in them, and that's what matters. 
And at times when we don't believe in you, what counts is that you always believe in us and that you continually help us and that you are with us. And this is what gives us that great ointment that we need, that soothing ointment, ointment of our faith, the hope. And as we pray today, we pray to you, our loving Father, the Father that loves us and that wouldn't give us anything that wasn't good for us. And so we accept all the things that have come our way as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And during this month of May, we honor in a special way our Blessed Mother and we ask for her prayers as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.